Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and this is Stuff You Should Know, uh, celebrating Native American Heritage Month. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, And we are talking about something that we probably would have talked about whether it was Native American Heritage Month or not, but we selected it for this month in particular, just as a nod, a shout out. Um, but we're talking about one of those um, moments in history that probably most people are walking around and are like, oh yeah, the Apache Wars, I've, I've heard of that, but no, almost nothing about. Even though depending on how you look at it, it's actually still to this day the longest war that the United States ever fought. Really? Yeah, and it produced some really famous, really interesting, really um, amazing characters on both sides, but in particular among the Apache, uh, who and we'll meet a lot of them in this episode. Yeah, and these are you know a series of skirmishes over time that um, it seems like there was there was often peace, and then there were these inciting incidents that would happen. Mm-hmm. There were misunderstandings that happened. Uh, there were bungled um, negotiations that happened. Mm-hmm. And like, it, it feels like it could have gone a different way. Oh, yeah. At so, at so many points, and it continually just went south. Yeah, and I mean, speaking, you know, history is written by the victors. And so the idea of the Apache basically being, um, you know, bloodthirsty, cruel, merciless, um, you know, people who mm-hmm. mutilated victims and would kill women and children. Um, you know, that's that's definitely painted. Uh, it, it paints the whole the whole group with a much larger brush than you should, but it also leaves out the atrocities that were committed on the other side too. Well, yeah, their people were slaughtered as well. Exactly. So um, it's just one of those things where it was a war, like it was a genuine straight up war. But like you said, there are plenty of places where it could have been avoided. And we'll talk about those. But first, Chuck, I think we should talk about the Apache. And one of the first things that I learned when I started researching this is that the Apache are not a nation or a tribe. They're a group of loosely affiliated tribes that all kind of come from the same area. And despite the fact that we tend to think of the Apache as totally tied to the southwestern United States, they actually arrived fairly recently from western Canada, like B.C., I take it. That's right. Uh, And they eventually found their way to the American uh, southwest. Uh, They did not—we call them Apache. They they do not call themselves that. They called themselves, uh, I guess, Inde, uh, which means the people, Mm -hmm. which is pretty great and Mm -hmm. basic. Right. And uh, they think the name Apache may have been given to them from the word Apache by the Zuni tribe who uh, battled with them many times. And that means uh, Apache means enemy Mm -hmm. in Zuni. So they think that's where Apache came from. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that they were a, a, a loose collection. I mean, there were never like hundreds of thousands of Apache. Right. Uh, I'm not sure where the numbers topped out, but they were spread over 15 million square miles. Wow. So that's called a very, very thin uh, distribution. So they were, uh, you know, not to skip ahead too much, but they were rarely in groups um, more than like 25 or 30 at a time. Right, right. And so what you would call the Apache were actually kind of spread out among the Western Apache. Um, there's the Chiricahua Apache. Um, and then these larger groups were split into smaller bands even. And the Chiricahua are kind of like the central group that um, fought the Apache Wars, although just about every Apache um, tribe was involved. But the Chiricahua were kind of like the central figures. And the Chiricahua were, were broken into four different smaller bands. Uh, the Bed, Bedonkohi, the no. Cho- <laughs> Let's hear it. Bedonkohe. Thank you, Chuck. Mm-hmm. The Chokonin. Yep. Chaheni. Chaheni, yeah. And the uh, Nedni. Yeah, great. Okay. So the uh, So what was the first one again? Badonkahe. Badonkahe. That's much better than mine. But all of these groups, these four bands that form the Ch- Chiricahua Apache, um, totaled maybe fifteen hundred people at their at their largest um, population size. 
Um, and despite that really small number, they produced some really famous people like Geronimo, Cochise, uh, Victorio. All of them were Chiricahua Apache. And again, they were the central group that fought the Apache Wars. They were also the central group that could have stemmed off the Apache Wars if um, some of the uh, Union soldiers that they had to deal with had taken them a different way. That's right. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned that there were a lot of misunderstandings and mix-ups along the way. And combine that with the fact that um, the settlers uh, just thought they were all Apache and that they all were the same. Right. There were misunderstandings like, uh, you know, a raid would happen on a camp. And this is one of the, the ways that the Apache got by is they would, you know, not because they didn't like somebody, because they needed supplies and stuff, they would raid a camp, take some stuff. And the settlers would think, well, this is just – this is the Apache. It's all of you doing this, whereas it might be one very small group mm -hmm. and the other groups will be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. And that's why I was saying you can't really paint the 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 people we call the Apache with this very large brush because some of them worked very closely and for the U.S. military to go find other Apache. Um, even within the Chiricahua, there were totally different ideas on how to approach and deal with the Americans. Yeah. Um, there was a big division that developed through the Apache Wars in among the Apache of, of, you know, some of them were like, look, we cannot defeat this enemy. The best thing we can do in, to hope to, to live peacefully is to just settle down and start farming and live on these reservations that they're, mm -hmm. they're making us live on. And the other group said, no, we're, we need to fight to the death for our ancestral lands yeah. and our old ways of life. And so there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of difference. There's a lot of disagreement among these people who are living and fighting during the Apache Wars. And even some of the ones that wanted to live peacefully were frequently forced into fighting like that was their only choice um and it, so it's it's just really important to keep in mind that you you can't just just like you can't say apache and that's just one nation because it's not um you also can't just say well all the apache thought this way or even all the chiricahua thought this way uh there was just a lot of a lot of difference and there was also a lot of room for different opinions because like you said, the groups that they lived in really were usually no more than 25 or 30. and like a, a family or a couple of families. Exactly. And they were often related by blood and marriage. And it was a matrilineal society, too. So if you were a man and you married a woman, you joined your, your wife's family uh, from that point on. And so these bands, these four bands of the Chiricahua, were, um, were very much— uh, related to one another because they would often swap, you know, um, members through marriage uh, and alliances. That's right. So uh, I mentioned the raids as a way of life for them. Um, that is different than, uh, like, there was no malice involved. That was different from, like, an actual skirmish or a battle mm -hmm. uh, when the warriors would, would take center stage. And that was serious stuff. They were um, They were people that very much – uh, wanted revenge when they were wronged. And that's when those sort of really bloody skirmishes would take place, mm -hmm. as opposed to the raids, which was uh, them, you know, getting food and supplies and ammunition and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, there was uh, a, an author of a book called The Apache Wars, a guy named Paul Andrew Hutton, said that, that he likened them to the Vikings, that they just, like, raiding was out of economic necessity. The thing is, is they were also, again, can't paint them all with one brush, there were plenty of them that were raiders, um, and all of them apparently engaged in raiding, but some much more than others. And then uh, the ones that didn't raid so much, they might farm a little more or they might engage in peaceful trade with their neighbors. But the, 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 the one commonality that basically all groups labeled as Apache seem to have had was a, a, um, like an enemy in Mexico. First yeah. the Spanish, and then later Mexico, where, like, if you were caught by a uh, Mexican and you were an Apache, or you were a Mexican and you were caught by Apache, you were going to face a very brutal, unhappy end um, almost immediately. Like, there, there was, they weren't going to, like, release you as a hostage or negotiate for your release. You were going to be killed horribly. Yeah, and they uh, were united uh, sometimes with the settlers against Mexico, uh, so much so that I believe uh, one of the chiefs told 
uh, Kit Carson, who was an American scout uh-huh. in 1846, like, hey, we'll team up with you to fight Mexico. That's how much we hate Mexico. Yeah, that chief was Mangus Coloradus, and he was actually one of the um, one of the first great leaders at this time. Uh, at this moment in history when the Americans first started showing up. And he was very much interested in peace with the Americans, um, not even necessarily out of necessity, but like you said, like the the common enemy was Mexico, and he thought Americans were great because they hated Mexico as much as, as the uh, Apache did. That's right. Uh, the one problem with the Chiricahua is that they had a nice place uh, where they lived. I mean, they were seasonal um, migrators, and so they would kind of move around. But um, one of the main places that they hung out was south south of the Gila River in Arizona, mm-hmm. and it was a really a really good place to be. So that means, of course, as westward expansion happens, or as we'll see later, as uh, the Civil War happens, and then Union troops head west to try and keep it from falling into the hands of the Southerners. That's going to be a place where they're going to go. There are going to be wagon trains going through there. Eventually, there's going to be railroads going through there. And so there was basically no chance that the Chiricahua were just going to be left alone to do their thing. No, but this was their ancestral land, and they weren't exactly, you know, ones to leave other people alone through their raiding um, and wars for revenge. So, like, again, like, the stage was definitely set for Apache Wars, but it's wrong to say that they were inevitable. And the reason why it was wrong to say that they were inevitable is because there was some early stuff that happened that didn't have to happen that really kind of kicked this off. But I propose we take a break before we start talking about those things. Let's do it. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay, Chuck. So um, one of the first things that was um, that that a lot of people point to as the thing that kicked off the Apache War uh, or wars, I should say, took place in 1861, and it came to be known as the Bascom Affair. And from what I saw, almost every site that writes about uh, Lieutenant George Bascom wrote that he was young, inexperienced, over enthusiastic, overzealous, even, and pretty much incompetent when it came to something as tense and uh, unsure as negotiating for the release of hostages. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened uh, in 1861. The uh, oh, this is one I didn't look up. The Aravapa. Um, I'm going with Aravaipa. Okay, <laughs> they were yet another band of Apache that raided uh, a farm of a settler named John Ward. Went off to the Chiricahua Mountains, uh, which is where Cochise was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they did the usual stuff. They took livestock, uh, but they also made the mistake of kidnapping uh, John Ward's stepson, Felix Ward, which is when uh, Lieutenant Bascom was sent in to bring them to justice, to negotiate something. He invites Cochise to a meeting. And again, they went to Cochise's territory. He was not behind this. Right. And when he got in a tent with Cochise and said, this is what you did, this is one of those <clears throat> was those things. Cochise was like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Uh, we had nothing to do with this, but here's what I'll do. I'll try and found out. I'll try and find out who was behind this, mm-hmm. and I'll track him down, and I'll bring him to you. And Bascom said, and which was a pretty good deal, uh, considering yeah. he didn't have anything to do with it. And Bascom said, no. And you know what? You're going to stay here as our hostage, uh, along with your family members. And Kochi said, uh, I don't think so. I'm going to cut a hole in this tent in the middle of the night and leave. Right. They're like, how did he cut a hole in the tent? <laughs> no. It doesn't make any sense. He disappeared. But he he had to leave his family behind to make his escape. And um, Bascom now had his family as hostages. So Cochise went out um, and got his own hostages. They raided a wagon train and a stagecoach and got both Mexican and American hostages. And the Mexicans, they dispatched immediately in some really terrible way. They, they tied them to a wagon and then lit the wagon on fire. Um, so the Mexican uh, hostages had zero chance. But the Americans, um, Cochise kept alive, 
uh, to to use as um, pawns in, in negotiating the, the release of his own family. Um, and apparently, Bascom was unmoved. He said, no, we're not releasing your family until we get that livestock and that um, that kid that was initially kidnapped back. That's that's how your family's going to get released. And so after a few days of trying to negotiate uh, or an exchange of hostages, um, Cochise ordered the uh, American hostages killed. And then Bascom ordered Cochise's family killed, which is really something for a U.S. Army officer to do. But that's what happened. They were executed. Um, the women were let go. But um, Co- Cochise's favorite brother was among the ones that were killed. And that did not sit very well with Cochise. That, a lot of people say the Bascom affair is what kicked off the the um, the Apache Wars. Not everyone agrees, actually. There's there's other stuff that came later. Just real quick, the death of, of um, Mangus Coloradus, that really important early chief who wanted to ally with the Americans. In 1863, he was invited for peace talks and um, was held and executed. Um, the the peace talks were just a ruse, and he was grossly mutilated after he was murdered. They cut his head off, boiled the skin from his skull, sent his skull off to a phrenologist in New York. Um, and a lot of people say that's probably what what started the Apache Wars, because not only was that a, a brutal way to treat Mangus Colorado, this very respected chief, but it also showed that, like, you couldn't trust the Union Army to engage in actual peace, peace talks. They might just kill you. They, they might just as soon kill you. And that also they killed a really big ally and steadying hand among the Ch- Chiricahua. All right, so I mentioned earlier the Civil War getting cranked up uh, back east and Union soldiers coming out to kind of, you know, safeguard or, or at least protect Southerners from coming into the American Southwest. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the Chiricahua are like, hey, if we want to do some raiding, this is pretty great because they've got all kinds of supplies, all kinds of uh, munitions, and it, it's a pretty pretty good group of people to try and raid. And how some of these raids went down as far as the military is concerned, uh, there was a battle in 1862 that was pretty typical is that they would raid the military, but the military it was far more uh, outguns them. And so the Apache retreat, uh, but a retreat to the Apache was not some bad thing. It was actually a tactic because they could just sort of, they're like, why just get slaughtered uh, because of pride when we can retreat and really disappear into the desert? And like, they will not find us. We know this land so well. We can really hide out here because we're few in number, and we know this territory, and there are historians that basically agree that say, you know, if it wasn't for uh, Apache that ended up working with the military to turn on their own people, like they could have never been found if they didn't want to be. Yeah, and it wasn't even necessarily turning on their own people. Again, that's looking at it through the idea that all Apache were the same, but we're talking about like the White Mountain Apache um, or the the Dark Rocks people Apache, like people that, that were – might as well have been enemies to the Chiricahua. So, like, the idea of them working with the, the army as scouts to find these other Apache wasn't, you know, quite as much as as being like a, a Benedict Arnold kind of thing. Yeah, not, not turning on their own tribe. Right, right. So, um, I found, Chuck, there's actually a Confederate, um, like, officer that's buried in Arizona because the Confederacy actually made its way, managed to get to Arizona and occupied it for a brief time. And they themselves also got into skirmishes with the Apache there. And one of them got killed. So there's a guy that's buried who is a Confederate soldier in Arizona. Wow. So um, we should probably talk about the Camp Grant massacre because this is a big turning point. We have lots of raids and skirmishes and battles and atrocities that have been going on during the first um, Apache Wars, generally how it's kind of loosely gathered together. But the Camp Grant massacre in 1871, it was a big turning point because the Aravaipa chief, Eskimenzin's, um people, were camped out near um, Tucson at an army encampment, like peacefully settling there. They were not like scouting or doing anything like that. But the people of Tucson were worried that there were raiders among them. And so they preemptively massacred the um, the Apache that were there. And I think all but eight of the 144 people that were killed in that massacre of the Apache um, were women and children. Um, and that 
I think something like 27 kids were kidnapped and sold into slavery and very soon came to work in some of the homes of Tucson's most affluent families. It was a huge atrocity that was carried out by the white settlers of Tucson. Um, and it had a huge effect on not just the, um, the uh, Arava Ipa uh, Apache, but also the Chiricahua as well. And it also had a big effect on President Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, who was furious when he heard about this. And he actually threatened to put Arizona under martial law unless this whole thing got sorted out. And he sent a peace delegation to speak with Cochise to see if they could keep uh, this war from continuing on or breaking out further. That's right. Uh, so they offered a truce. Uh, they said, here's what we'll do. If you agree to move to this reservation in San Carlos, then uh, we can have a peace treaty and a truce in line. Uh, San Carlos was not a good place to be. No. Um, it was terrible. Uh, the settlers knew this. Uh, the Apache knew this. They all called it uh, Hell's 40 Acres. And so it was not a place that they wanted to go. But uh, Cochise negotiated and said, you know what, we're not going there, but if we can create our new reservation that's just for us mm -hmm. and we can come and go as we please, uh, then we'll, we'll get on board with this truce. And Grant said, okay. And they had a peace, and it lasted about four years. Uh, eventually, Cochise died of stomach cancer, though. And that was, you know, one thing that kind of weakened the peace accord. Yeah. Uh, there was also an incident where – uh, there were a couple of Chiricahua Apache who killed two white men uh, who didn't give them whiskey. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and both of these incidences basically just sort of chipped away, and all of a sudden there was no more truce. No, because the people who lived in the area were like, we don't like this idea that the Chiricahua get to like come and go off of their reservation as they please. And in fact, they were staging raids in Mexico, which was not part of the treaty, but it was an oversight. Um, and so like all those things combined, like especially with the death of Cochise, like that that treaty ended. Um and so that like this, the I think it was a four year, um, four year peace, and when that ended, the second Apache Wars began. That's right. Uh, and Cochise's son Taza took his place. Um, they said, you know, basically that um, that reservation was abolished that they were happy with, and they said, well great, that means we can just go back and live on, you know, wherever we want and, and migrate around. And they said, no, not really. Um, we'd like you to go back to the San Carlos Reservation that we know you hate. Mm -hmm. And so they started negotiating. Uh, Taza had another uh, uh, Chiricahua chief named Hu, Chief Hu, J-U-H, who uh, he was with uh, Badanka Hayes. And he had a stutter, though. So he said, I don't like to negotiate in person with my stutter. I'm going to have a proxy. My brother-in-law, uh, Goyakla, is going to speak for me. He's a medicine man. But you might know him by his other name, Geronimo. Yeah. And everyone went, whoa. <laughs> right. We've heard of him. Uh, Geronimo, by this time, he was already nicknamed as Geronimo because uh, it was the uh, Mexicans who gave Geronimo his nickname. And still to this day... No one knows what the heck they meant by that. Uh, it turns out that Geronimo is a really rare Italian version of the name Jerome. And we're talking about Mexican uh, and Spanish people, not Italian. So it'd be weird for them to give him the name Jerome. And even if they had given him the, the name Jerome, it wouldn't make any sense because that means sacred name. And by the way, you know, Hieronymus? Sure. That's a version of Geronimo. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. So regardless, it's lost to history why they called him Geronimo. But they would shout Geronimo during um, some raids that he staged into Mexico. And Geronimo went into Mexico because if there was anybody who hated, among the Apache, who hated Mexican uh, people, it was Geronimo. He had watched them slaughter his uh, family, including his mother and his wife and some children, um, and he never, he never forgot it. He never forgave him. And every chance he had to kill uh, a Mexican, he, he would take it gladly. That's right. I mean, he was genuinely scarred as a young man. So it, it wasn't just like man hell-bent on revenge. It was man who suffered like deep, deep traumas uh, losing his family like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where all that came from. But he was a complicated guy. He was, uh, you know, if, if you 
talk to Americans. He was known as, uh, quote, the worst Indian that ever lived, end quote. He had a bad temper. He was paranoid. He was a fierce fighter who would not hang back, you know, and like shoot arrows from long distances. He would charge the enemy Mm -hmm. and run in a zigzag so he wouldn't get hit with a bullet, although apparently he did get hit with a bullet quite a bit, as we'll find out later. And then he would knife people and take their guns, and he didn't even know how to use guns. He would take guns back to the other Apache. So he got this nickname uh, They as like Mexicans would shout it to warn each other, and then it became something that the Apache latched onto Mm -hmm. as like a chant of enthusiasm. Right. And so Geronimo was never a chief. He became a leader, but he was never a chief, and apparently he really didn't like people who um, accidentally confused him as a chief. Um, but he he had like a lot of say being a medicine man for the Badonkahi, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and b- b- being that proxy of the actual chief who. So he was part of these talks. And the, the, the idea was or the, the decision was between who and Taza and Geronimo that um, the – the Apache could either move to the San Carlos resignation, Reservation, which had been designated for Apache, or they could live life on the run um, and basically be hunted and exterminated by the U.S. Army. That was their choice. And so Taza, who was the son of Cochise and who was his designated heir, said, I, I, we should we – should, Like, my father knew, like, there's no way to defeat these people. We need to just, you know, live in peace with them. And I I guess it means we have to move to the San Carlos Reservation. Something like like a third of the Apache followed him. But two-thirds said, no, we're going to go the way of Geronimo and who? And that is to just basically escape and start staging raids and fighting and living life on the run. Yeah, and Geronimo, this is really uh, the the point in time where his legend really began to grow uh, as far as the Americans are concerned. And he was, uh, like I said, he was a complicated guy. He would um, he would get criticized by his own people for mm-hmm. for for you know not giving up when he should, for being reckless in their eyes with some of these young soldiers who weren't as prepared as they need to be, and was basically always just sort of like at this point at least go full bore and try and win these battles as like brutally as possible. Mm -hmm. So this was happening. He was getting a reputation among his own people. At some points, uh, there was a point in 1883 where he staged a raid uh, on that San Carlos reservation, captured another Chiricahuan leader named Chief Loco Mm -hmm. and 200 of his followers. And basically at gunpoint said, you're with me now and you got to help us fight. Yeah. So he was... Uh, he, he wasn't always looked upon the best by his own people, even because of stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, Chief Loco and his followers were like, "No, we're just trying to, um, we're just trying to to live peacefully. Leave us alone." And and Geronimo said, "No." So they were kind of pressed in the service. Other groups, he uh, he and his band attracted just because they wanted to fight too. Mm-hmm. It was that division of, no, we need to protect our ancestral lands and our old ways of living. Um, and so he attracted, like, Chief Chihuahua, Chief Nana, uh, who was also a Chihene, like Chief Loco. And that actually, um, that, that, that kind of shows that division of opinions and thoughts where Chief Loco is like, no, we need to live, we need to live peacefully. And he was a Chihene. Um, Chief Nana was also a Chihene, and he was like, no, I'm, he was at Geronimo's side throughout this entire fight. They, a lot of people say that Chief Nana, he was very old even during this time, um, and he lived to be a very old man, but he also died fighting. They think that he probably killed more Americans than any Apache in history just because he was um, he fought so much and he lived for so long. He was apparently also a really um, brilliant strategist as well. All right, so... Well, should we take a break or should we wait? We could take a break. Is this our second one? I've lost track because this is a thrilling story. All right. Let's take our second break and we'll pick back up right after this. Okay.
All right. So at the same time, kind of concurrently to uh, Geronimo and all, all his battling going on, the Chahaney started to fight uh, the Americans at the same time. And they did this because of another kind of a weird incident um, caused by Geronimo, almost an accident. Uh, he escaped. He had a knack for escaping. He was really good at that. Mm-hmm. We'll see time and time again. If you had Geronimo, you didn't have him for very long. Yeah. So he escaped and snuck onto a reservation at uh, Ojo Caliente. And this was this was kind of a big deal. Like, they weren't supposed to be there. They were supposed to – the Chahaney were – uh, they were supposed to be at San Carlos. Mm-hmm. They had set up this other reservation. And again, it was, you know, no one knew they were there because things were so spread out. They were living peacefully. But this Geronimo escaping and going to their encampment, they were like, hey, man, thanks a lot. Like now everybody knows we're here. Mm-hmm. He brought the and, heat on them. Yeah, put the serious heat on them to the point where they said, you know, if you're off of this reservation, you're going to be shot on sight. Yeah. And this kind of launches another one of the Apache Wars, or another part. Yeah, the Warm Springs Band of the Chahaney um, were led by Chief Victorio, and they were forced, now that they now that they were found out that they were living on Ojo Caliente, which I guess was, you know, a nicer reservation as far as reservations went, that they were supposed to be on, in San Carlos, they, they were faced with the same decision. Go live in this hell of San Carlos or live on the run. And so Chief Victorio said, all right, we've been living peacefully. We gave it a shot. Uh, the jig is up. Now we are going to go back to living on the run. And for two years, Chief Victorio and his band was fu- were fu- staging their own Apache war, uh, concurrent with Geronimo and his band staging a different Apache war. And Chief Victorio's war and the band that, that followed him were so effective that Mexico and America, which hated each other still, had been engaged in the Mexican-American War less than a decade before um, and were just not fast friends by any measure. Um, Mexico allowed the U.S. to uh, have its army enter Mexico and chase Chief Victorio and his band. That's how much they were hated by both the Mexicans and the Americans. And and um, that's the links that they went to. And apparently they were actually eventually found by a Mexican-American joint expedition. The Mexican contingent said, Americans, you should probably leave. And that deep, deep centuries-old hatred between the Mexicans and the Apache was really kind of brought to the fore, and the Mexicans sla- slaughtered Victorio. Right. Up until this point, though, Victorio had a lot of success uh, with only about 150 warriors uh, to fight with. Yeah. And one of the the big reasons was this woman named Lozen. Uh, Lozen was was pretty incredible and someone who, I mean, not certainly not lost to history, but someone that you probably never learned about in, in like high school history. So she was uh, Victoria's sister known as the Apache Joan of Arc. Yeah. Uh, she was a Chahaney Chiricahua medicine woman. She was a great fighter. She was a great strategist. She uh, she was wise beyond her years. She would she would kind of do anything. I mean, there were great uh, legends of her, like uh, like helping to give birth on the battlefield in the desert, mm-hmm. uh, and then like you know going right back to fighting, and uh, did a little Stevie Nicks kind of deal where apparently she would hold her hands <laughs> out to the side. And pray and lift her palms up and turn in a circle, mm-hmm. and uh, she said, and of course this is this is uh, lore, but she said that she could she would know the direction where the enemy was coming from from these tingles that she would get, and depending on how intense the tingles were, she could even tell how far the, away they were from them. Yeah, it's still Chiricahua legend today that it was Lozen who allowed Victorio and a small band of 150 people to survive for two years. Um, as long as they did, from this this weird special talent she had of knowing where the enemy was coming from and how far away they were, and sometimes how how strong their troop numbers were, um, and then they would move and dictate like their raids based on her basically her visions, um, and it was uh, it, the idea is kind of supported by the fact that Lozen wasn't there when Victorio and the last of his band met their end at the hand of the Mexicans. She was um, off smuggling a uh, woman, a new mother, and her newborn infant um, back to the reservation so that the mom and the baby could live safely. 
And when she got to the reservation, she got news that that her brother, Victorio, and the rest of the uh, band that was fighting with him had all been slaughtered. And there's a there's a discrepancy historically about how Victorio died, right? Yeah, he either died, you know, fighting until his last breath or he took his own life at the last minute. Yeah. So um, either way, all of that band fought fought to their death. And Lozen wasn't ready to give up fighting either. She was actually on the reservation and could have stayed there. Instead, she immediately made her way to go find Geronimo and his band, and she joined up with them. What if Lozen had just been stealing uh, maps and plans from the other side? <laughs> right. And she was like, watch this. They love this stuff. <laughs> right. And she like does the Stevie Nicks. <laughs> right. The spin with the palms out kind of thing. She's like, oh, I'm yeah. getting She's tingly. Like, yeah, they eat this up. I'm going to be a legend. Watch this. Right. Pretty good stuff. Um, so now we find ourselves kind of coming toward the end of the Apache Wars, uh, where things get really interesting uh, when a man named General George Crook arrived on the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, they called him the Tan Wolf because he wore uh, khaki a lot, had a knack for khaki. They had a lot of respect for him. Uh, he had respect for them. He earned his name fighting against the Sioux with Custer uh, years ago. But now he was back, uh, I guess he was a really good tracker too, because time and time again, as we'll see, he tracked down Geronimo. Uh, They were holding out in Mexico at this point, Mm -hmm. and he wanted to negotiate, but uh, things were pretty tense at the time. So there were still a couple of skirmishes, and I think Geronimo uh, and some of his guys were up on a cliff uh, above Crook's company, and they were kind of taunting uh, Crook's Apache scouts. Right. Things were not going well. But uh, it it ended up in a very strange turn of events working out because Crook was a hunter and Mm -hmm. was going off hunting the next day by himself and was tracking an animal and ended up tracking this animal, or I don't know if he found the animal in the camp, but eventually made his way right up to Geronimo and where Geronimo was camped out and was like, oh, hi there. And Geronimo says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to kill you. Which he totally uh, could have. I mean, Crook was there with a single gun by himself with no cover, and he just accidentally stumbled upon Geronimo and some of his, his warriors. That's I can imagine how tense that situation was. Even Crook knowing that they respected him and he respected them, it's still Geronimo. Like, again, what what the, the Americans considered the worst Indian that ever lived. That's right. So the writing was kind of on the wall at this point. Uh, with American encroachment. Geronimo was like, there are endless numbers of you guys. You have way more weapons, way more ammunition, way more supplies than we could could ever get. And uh, we've been on the run, and I don't think uh, it's going to work out for us in the end. So maybe it's finally time to not fight and to sit down at the negotiating table since you seem like someone who is at least honorable enough to negotiate something honest. And Geronimo is the last holdout to come to this conclusion. By this time, like, it was just he and his band. The rest of the uh, Apache or the rest of the um, Chiricahua um, had either concluded that it was best to just settle down and and, um, adapt to reservation life or they had been killed fighting. So for Geronimo to finally come to this conclusion, he had been worn out because he was the kind to just keep going and keep going and keep going and inspire others to keep going. So he, um, he decides to surrender to Crook. And apparently the surrender lasted a very short time. But one of the reasons why he did surrender was Crook said that, um, that they would create a, a new reservation near Turkey Creek, which is where Geronimo was born. Um, and so they weren't going to move them to San Carlos. I don't know if you've noticed a pattern or not, everybody, but when the only option was move to San Carlos or die, very frequently the Apache chose die uh, or fight to the death um, because that's how bad San Carlos was. Whenever there was another reservation put on the table, the Apache tended to say, okay, we'll, we'll go give that a shot. So it just really kind of points out like how much of this could have been avoided, not just from George Bascom never being involved or not just from them torturing and killing Mangus, um, Colorado, but if they had just improved the the way of living at San Carlos or gotten rid of San Carlos and just created these other better reservations, the Apache Wars might never have, have taken the effect that they had either, you know? It's like uh, when Clarice Starling offered mm-hmm. 
Hannibal Lecter to stay on Anthrax Island. Plum Island. Plum Island. If it had gone a different way, if they had offered him a real, like, nice place, Mm -hmm. maybe no one else would have died. No. Maybe they would have caught Buffalo Bill before. Well, wait a minute. They did. It all worked out just fine, thanks (laughs) to Plum Island. You know, someone, a a fan of the movie, bought the Buffalo Bill house and has has made it basically a... Silence of the Lambs Museum. Wow. And I think he's building out the basement to where you can Airbnb it and stay there. Oh, boy. That sounds cool. awful. It's pretty great. Is and, it, it's, and that's just like the story of Geronimo. Is it in um, Ohio for real? Oh, I, don't, I don't remember where the real one is. Because, hmm. you know, very sure. frequently they'll just be like, this house will work. No one will ever know it's in right. Ohio. No one will ever buy this house and turn it into Airbnb and publicize that it's actually it's in cool. Colorado, you know? I hope he makes money off of it. So, um, so Geronimo surrenders a total chuck of four different times. Surrenders, escapes, surrenders, escapes. Um, and the reason he keeps escaping is because he was about as hated uh, as anyone ever was in this stage of American history. Not just out west, but even back east. He was hated, mistrusted. Um, and there were editorials that he would read written in the local paper of wherever, whatever reservation he was having, he was being held at. Um, that were calling for his immediate execution and murder, sometimes by mobs and vigilantes. So uh, apparently he had a very uh, large weakness for alcohol. And when he got drunk, you could really convince him that they were going to kill him if he didn't escape. So he surrendered and escaped four different times. And on the last time, uh, Crook was sent in with different marching orders, this time by President Grover Cleveland, who said, there's no terms of surrender anymore. Geronimo surrenders unconditionally or he dies and crook said that doesn't really sit well with me yeah he resigned and uh i think ever since then you know uh or at least back then of course he was r- really looked down upon for doing that by uh his fellow american soldiers mm-hmm. so there's a bounty for, on for having integrity just want to be clear about right. that okay uh there's a bounty on geronimo's head at this point for 25 grand a lot of money, and a new general takes over named General Nelson Miles. Uh, he was sort of the opposite of Crook in that he had no respect for the Apache. They had no respect for him. Uh, he would do his leading from forts uh, many, many miles away from the real action, and he was uh, he kind of ruined things in the end uh, that, that we'll get to here in a second. But this last summer of freedom here in 1886 for the Chiricahua, um, I think it was uh, Natchi was the chief at this point. Yeah, and uh, he was Taza's brother um, who was not bred to be chief, but Taza died on a trip to Washington, D.C. So now you had a chief that was easily manipulated through Geronimo, just FYI. So there was there were only like 37 uh, free Chiricahua at this point that were still down to battle. Uh, 18 of them were the warrior types, uh, there were 13 women and six kids, including a couple of infants. Mm-hmm. And these uh, 37 people were on the lam for five full months with a total of about, you know, eight to 10,000 uh, either uh, Army, U.S. Army or Mexican soldiers or volunteers trying to find them. <laughs> it's crazy. Like they could really blend into their territory. Yeah, they did so well at that, Chuck. There was only one death that entire summer of that band of 37. And Geronimo was loving it. He was like, Mm -hmm. in retrospect, he was like, this was, these were the salad days. I did some of my best fighting. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, there were a few of us, uh, you know, I I could, I knew when they were coming. I didn't do the Stevie Nicks, but I knew, (laughs) I knew what was going to happen before it happened. I was so on my game. So that General Miles guy, he came up with a plan. Like he knew that the um, the the Apache, the Chiricahua that were on San Carlos Reservation were still very closely tied to this band of 37 that were following Geronimo. Um, and so he sent word through two Apache scouts that the um, family members, for the 434 uh, Chiricahua on the reservation had been shipped to a prison in Florida. And that if they ever wanted to see their family again, they needed to give up and surrender. And this proved to be the last straw for Geronimo. He said, okay, fine, I'm going to surrender. And he negotiated, he managed to negotiate terms. He agreed to be, uh, to live in exile for two years as a prisoner of war. 
but it turned out that the um, the those terms were not honored, and he never was able to uh, to make his way back to his his homeland, his ancestral land uh, in South Arizona, New Mexico, again after he left. That's right. Uh, I believe that they were uh, he was reunited with his family, eventually in Alabama, yeah, uh, and then moved out to Oklahoma. Yes, neither uh, of which were his original. You know, I think to the Americans back then, they were like, "Oh, look, we're sending you to Oklahoma, where your where your your people are from." So that's probably great, right? Yeah. So the the problem was is that the people who finally did make it to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, and again, this is just a melting pot hodgepodge. They're like, "If you're a Native American, this is where you live now, Oklahoma." It was 27 years before any Chiricahua were allowed to move back to their ancestral lands. And at the time, about a third of them said, no, this is our home now. Um, you know, most of us were born here. A lot of us were born here. So there's a, a Fort Sill, Oklahoma um, contingent of, of uh, Chiricahua. And then there's also the uh, Mescalero Reservation uh, Chiricahua that live, about two-thirds of them moved to that south, uh, so- southern Arizona area where they, they live still today. And Geronimo, if you've ever seen, uh, there, I mean, there are quite a few famous portraits and photographs of Geronimo, mm-hmm. and that's because Geronimo went on to be pretty famous. Yeah, uh, he w- later on toured with Buffalo Bill in his sideshow. He would uh, he would sell his little trinkets from his coat uh, to to people who would pay top dollar, like buttons, uh, and then he just replace it with another button and wait for the next person. That's right. And he rode in Teddy Roosevelt's uh, election parade. Yeah. And uh, as legend has it, a lot of people came to see Geronimo, uh, more so than Teddy Roosevelt even. He asked personally Teddy Roosevelt permission to go back to his ancestral lands, and Teddy Roosevelt refused, even though this is long past the two years that he had negotiated in the terms of his surrender. Teddy Roosevelt said, basically, you don't want to go back there. There's too many people that want to see you hang still. And so Geronimo actually died on the reservation at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, He uh, had been drinking pretty heavily that day, fell off his horse, um, and laid in a ditch all night and apparently caught pneumonia. And as he was dying, he, he regretted not having fought to the death, even though he managed to live uh, to be an old man. Um, and in retrospect, this, the, the Apache Wars were, um, again, that was, depending on how you look at it, the longest lasting war in American history. And it was also extraordinarily bloody, especially for the Americans. Remember, the Chiricahua numbered maybe 1,500, and they managed to engage in a a 25-year war with the American army and the Mexican army simultaneously. And there's a famous quote from William Tecumseh Sherman, who said, we had one war with Mexico to take Arizona, and we should have a another war to make them take it back. That's how devastating the Apache Wars were for the uh, the Americans. Wow. So that's the Apache Wars. Oh, one other thing, Chuck. So remember I said there was a division among the Chiricahua um, about ones who are like, we just want to live in peace and we'll adapt to reservation life. And the others say, no, we have to, we have to fight to the death for the old ways. Well, now, if you look back and you go on to the uh, Chiricahua tribe website uh, and you look, they proclaim themselves to be a peaceful tribe. So it turns out that that faction ultimately won out in the end. Very cool. You got anything else? No. Okay. Well, if you want to know more about the uh, Chiricahua and other Apache groups, there is plenty of really interesting history out there for you on the Internet. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this reminder that we have a lot of episodes. Uh, Hello, Josh and Chuckers. I'm writing you today from Georgetown, Texas, while currently listening to How Kleptomaniacs Work from 2009. Recently discovered your podcast and love it. So I decided to start at the beginning. Do y'all know y'all have 1,843 episodes? I don't think that's right. Uh, And Sarah says, holy hell, it's taking a while to get caught up. I really want to jump to new, but on the other hand... It's kind of fun and interesting to listen to past episodes. For example, Will the World End in 2012? Dodged a bullet on that one. Hmm. Uh, anyway, just want to send a quick hello. Love the show. Love how you smart guys, uh, that's in quotes, by the way, hmm. which means she doesn't really mean that. No. Uh, deliver info in a funny way. I also love that I get your random references to off the wall stuff. Uh, Simpsons episodes, 
uh, old school band names, uh, etc. Keep up the great work. Can't wait to hear what the future holds, i.e. 2021 episodes. And that is from Sarah A. Yes, well, Chuck, think about how red Sarah's face is going to be when she finally gets to that episode where you suggest sandwiching episodes. I know. Well, I'm going to tell Sarah. We'll see what happens here. Okay. I'm going to tell her I'm reading this listener mail. We'll see if we can't tempt her. I won't even tell her which episode it's in. Okay, so she'll hear this in like 27 years. No, no, no. I'm going to let her know, and she may she may start listening to the new episodes. You know what I'm saying? Okay, well, I think we've reached the end of this episode. And if you want to be like Sarah and get in touch with us, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.